Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, we'll start in like one minute so that um, people who just got out of class um, can join us. So we'll start definitely in one minute. And feel free to turn your cameras on so we can be more than just four people seeing each other. <laughs> we see each other all the time. So some new faces is always welcome. And just a quick announcement as well. If any of you want to join the mailing list to receive updates on our activities and the application process, uh, please go ahead and I will put our email in the chat box shortly. You can just shoot an email there and say, I want to be on the mailing list. So thanks for attending everyone. Okay, why don't we um, get started uh, for this informational session on EnviroLab Asia. Uh, my name is Albert Park. I'm a professor of history, uh, East Asian history at uh, Claremont McKenna. Um, I'll let my two partners introduce themselves as well as Rebecca. Uh, Mark Los Huertos, um, I'm a Pomona faculty member in environmental analysis and I do biogeochemistry and water and soils. Hi everyone, I'm Brown Williams in the Keck Science Department. Um, I'm an environmental scientist. I think a lot about oceans and climate um, and kind of biogeochemistry. Hi everyone, I'm the project administrator for EnviroLab Asia. So questions are usually directed to me. Thanks. <laughs> um, so we um, are holding this uh, informational session that we originally, we originally held one last week that was in person, but we thought that it would be helpful to have a virtual one for those who weren't able to attend. So EnviroLab Asia is a five college initiative anchored at CMC, but it's a five college initiative to study environmental issues through a cross-disciplinary lens. So if you go to our website, which is under still under construction, but you can still access um, everything on the website still, uh, you will see that EnviroLab Asia consists of many components that supports faculty, student research, and, and collaborations. And, and at the heart of all these collaborations and uh, a kind of um, uh, research teams has been the intersection between science, social sciences, and the humanities, which I think helps us to stand out as a as a, a program that really does try to fundamentally cross disciplinary work now among all of our activities um, and uh, and um, programs is um, the clinic trip uh, which uh, we're here to talk about and the clinic trip essentially is a way for student and faculty to intimately work together on a special topic concerning an environmental issue in Asia uh, through classroom work as well as outside research work. And what we do is we have 16 student fellows that we select. We have them um, uh, attend a class. It's called EnviroLab Asia Research and Methodologies, which is going to be held on Mondays from 1.15 to 4 p.m. And that's a fixed time. So, um, and that's a fixed day. So that, that, that's set in stone. Um, and uh, for 15 weeks, the students uh, learn about different research methodologies, about how to study the environment, as well as the region and country that we're, that we're studying, learning the culture, history, various aspects of the region and culture of the, of the, of the area that we're covering. Uh, 
in the class, the class itself will be split up into four labs, four research labs that are led by faculty members. Um, and on your applications, you've seen already that um, what are the four labs and what they're planning to do. Um, the labs led by the faculty leader will work outside of the classroom. Um, usually not, it, it's, it's something that's, uh, kind of negotiated between the students and faculty member about how many hours outside of classroom, but it's not so many hours, not like, like I would imagine so many you know, extensive hours outside of the classroom, but uh, kind of a man manageable amount of time where you work on the research project together. And the hope is that during the semester, you will work on it and prepare, work on it in a way to prepare for our clinic trip which will be held in uh, um, various parts of East Asia that were parts of China, considering Taiwan, Hong Kong, it might be mainland China. Now, um, just to um, kind of um, help you understand what we mean by China. So when we originally, first we acknowledge that the word China is complicated because it could mean various different um, land spaces, bodies, and so forth. When we originally uh, thought about going to China, we actually thought about going to mainland China. Um, but as we started to work out our uh, labs and uh, solicit uh, lab uh, kind of proposals from faculty members, uh, we expanded it to think, well, we're not only not going to ma mainland China, but then some labs want to go to Hong Kong, some want to go to Taiwan and perhaps some other parts where you have the China, Chinese diaspora. And so at this point, what we'll study in our class, as well as what we'll emphasize in our labs is that generally speaking, we're, when we're focusing on China, we're focusing on areas that have been heavily influenced and, um, and continue to be influenced and guided by you know, what we would consider Chinese history, culture, practices, traditions, institutions, and so forth. Um, whether that be in Hong Kong, Taiwan, Macau, or, or even parts of Hawaii or the United States and so forth. But, but, but um, we definitely do have the labs thinking already going to mainland China, Taiwan, and possibly Hong Kong. Um, I think that is about the overall description of the lab and the, um, and the, and the class. Um, perhaps, um, you know, Brandon and Mark, you can add stuff. And Rebecca, you probably may want to go over the details of like the application process. But, so go ahead, Mark Brandon, if you want to add anything. Well, I'll just, I'll just respond to questions that have been coming up. Um, the last week or so. Um, one of them is, what is the structure of the class? And Albert will be teaching it as a seminar. And it's already listed as a time from one to four. If you are unable to sign up for the class, then you're really not able to participate in the um, being a fellow. So the schedule of courses will be published, but you will have your whether or not you've been selected as a fellow before registration starts. Uh, it's a little bit of a tight um, timeline, but that's the idea. So, you know, if you find that you need to graduate or you have some required class you can't um, um, avoid, then you'll just let us know and we'll go to a, someone on the waiting list if you're not able to participate. The other thing I wanted to say was the applications themselves, which Rebecca does have more detail and she's put some stuff in the chat. Um, you know, we really are looking for people that are um, capable and comfortable in an interdisciplinary context. So you may see a lab that you think is really interesting, but you want to write your, um, your application process in a way that really demonstrates that you would be potentially uh, um, qualified and really happy in any of the labs that you might be selected in. You do but have a preference of two labs, but we really are looking for students that are a high level of disciplinary diversity, as well as college diversity um, and other um, things like gender and other kinds of things. So we're balancing a lot of different um, um, criteria when we're looking at the students. And what you will find is if you're interested in maybe indigenous um, people that you really think, okay, that lands because I'm an anthropologist, 
that only partially really satisfies what we're looking for in the labs because we really are looking for people that can cross across disciplines and feel comfortable um, in asking questions that might not be within their disciplinary training. And so, for example, if you're also looking at the lab that's focused on biology, you do, do not have to be a biologist to be in that lab. The lab leaders will train you to do those research methods um, in for that for the for the clinic trip. Um, and the only other thing I want to add to Albert's description is, you know, part of those lab leading, you might meet for an hour or um, every other week or a two hours every other week or a half an hour a couple times a week. I'm not sure. It'll depend on you and the faculty member deciding on the appropriate time that you guys can meet. That may be, um, you know, doing some research on a paper, learning some methods. Those sometimes will feel like an independent course, but it's not going to be adding like a whole nother course. And then there'll be times when you're presenting what you're learning in your lab group to the larger seminar. So it really is a back and forth between those labs, um, but you will be um, meeting with these, your lab leaders uh, regularly during the spring semester. So you're prepared for the clinic trip. Oh, by the way, the clinic trip will be two weeks. It'll be two weeks. It will be right after um graduation so Pomona and Spitzer I think graduation on Sunday um so the day after uh, will be the beginning of the clinic trip um for two weeks um and of course the entire clinic trip will be um fully funded in other words um there the students don't pay for the trip uh itself um so the 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 grant covers it yeah. so we had a question here um from victoria can you participate in the class if you can't attend the clinic trip no it um really is a it's it's a united um project um so it's it's really designed and built around being able to do both of those things. And you wouldn't be very um, helpful to your lab mates if you disappeared for two weeks and weren't able to do the research with them. I, is that fair, Albert? There, Brandon, were you gonna say something? No, I was gonna say I have nothing to add. Let's, okay. let's see what, what questions okay. you all have. And again, just to reiterate that I have put the file for how to apply in the chat box. And if for some reason you cannot access it, you can email us at envirolab.asia at cmc.edu. Please also bear in mind this information is being widely circulated through our mailing list on social media. So you can go to Twitter, Facebook, or get on our mailing list and you will probably receive these materials multiple times. So yes. <laughs> All right, another question. How likely is a clinic trip going to happen? I know some study abroad programs to China for the spring were already canceled. This is from Ivy. Uh, the clinic trip will happen because we have back up domestic locations uh, in the United States. And the one destination that is being discussed is Hawaii. So I can't, we cannot guarantee it will be held, but there is very, we will very much likely hold the trip um, this year. Okay, we have another question. What makes for a strong candidate? Prior research experience, upperclassman, major, et cetera. I would say that I don't think there is a single one strong candidate. We're not looking for 16 of the same type of person. We're looking to have a, um, a team of people that you know really complement each other. So there's different things we're looking for. We are looking for um, representation from the colleges and different experiences coming in. Um, I would say we would prefer sophomore and juniors, although we have taken first year and seniors with us. Um, first year sometimes aren't quite ready yet. And then with seniors, it's always nice if they can come back on to campus to, to share their experiences the following year and if they're seniors and they won't be here. So 
um, we tend to look at sophomores and juniors, but we have, again, we've taken everybody. Um, but I think putting a lot of thought into your application and being authentic in who you are, we're not anticipating any previous experience. Um, some of our students we've taken have never traveled abroad before, some have traveled a lot. So it really is just um, putting forth kind of who you are and know that probably more amazing people will apply than we can accept. And so acceptance or if you're declined is not a reflection on a view at all. It depends on just kind of who applies and how we can put together kind of a class that's gonna um, really complement each other to build a strong program. Um, and then there's a lot of other ways still to be involved with Envirolab Asia on campus. And so if you join the mailing group, then you'll get a lot of emails about stuff that we're doing. We're still ramping up um, this semester, but in the spring we should have a little bit more going on. Um, so that's kind of my, my opinion on the application. There is just not one type of strong thing to do. Okay, we had another question. Um, wanted to ask if there will be a change in the destin, sorry, change to the destination of the clinic trip. Will that change the content of the class and the labs? Well, let me just say that um, the, the umbrella ideas within the labs will probably be very, very, have a, a fair amount of fidelity. But even when we went two years ago, the lab leader and the lab students morphed their topic as the semester developed. And that happens naturally. So, so there, there is, again, the similar kind of thing um, that we've sort of harped on is you, you come into this with a fair amount of flexibility to what's going to happen. And the topics will probably not switch for disciplines over, but you might find that the boundary of the discipline shifts a little bit as we get closer to the course, or as a lab group, you might um, decide that you know this topic is really interesting and this is the way we're going at it now that we have four of us are, are meeting together every week and talking about it. Okay, another question. Do you anticipate funding to be extended or is this definitely the last year of the program? I'm a first year. Well, I don't, um, at the moment we are working to make sure that we can sustain this over the long term. So we can't guarantee anything right now, but there is, uh, there's a lot of effort being made right now to make sure that we could hold this next year and and in the upcoming years, we'll have more information on that probably more towards towards the um, towards the spring. Okay. Next question is: Is there any way to contact students who have participated in the Envira Lab Asia? program previously to ask about their personal experience. I can answer this one if you want, Albert. Okay, um, hi everyone. So the materials that I just posted, it's a PDF. There is a QR code there and it actually is a pretty lengthy video, not too lengthy, but long enough for you to get the gist of the program. And it's um, interviews with alumni from 2015, 2016. I mean, we don't give out people's emails, obviously, but I think that's a pretty good capture of what the program's about, and it would be very helpful for you to watch it. So that's on that PDF file that has been uploaded to the chat box, the QR code. Okay. All right, another question. Is it possible for the program to count for the environmental analysis major's additional nature science requirement? We have um, played back and forth with how the course satisfies and or doesn't satisfy EA requirements. First of all, there are very few students that are EA majors in the program. So it's a little, um, it doesn't always land perfectly well to have course requirements that satisfy majors that aren't in the EA program. But our first year, Albert and I both taught a, sci a science class and a um, humanities-based class. And the science class did satisfy the EA science requirement. But asking the students to take two courses for the clinic uh, for the, to being fellows was way too much. 
So we've dialed it back to teaching only the um, CMC history slash EA20 course, which does satisfy the humanities for a couple of the colleges, but we have not been uh, not feeling that we can load yet another class on the fellows for the science um, course. So there are other courses that satisfy EA30 and focus on East Asia, um, but uh, those I don't think they'll be taught this year. Okay, next question is related to similar a similar topic. Does any portion of the program count towards the CMC Lab Science GE? No. Nope. Uh, the next question is, when planning out our schedule, how much additional workload should we anticipate from the labs? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there, again, this is something that you work out with your faculty lab leader, and there really isn't a set amount for each week, because in the beginning, it could be a little um, more hours where uh, you maybe maybe one two or three additional hours, and that includes not only meeting but also the with the work time. Um, but as you progress through the sem semester, there might be less amount of work because you've done it all uh, in the in the very beginning. So um, it really it really does vary. I think the faculty lab leaders have always been very sensitive to the time of the students and knowing not to um, uh, kind of ask them to do too much work outside, outside of the class. Um, so again, that's something that there's no definitive answer about how much time you work on it. It really does depend on how much you, uh, how much the, how the discussion between the lab leader and, and the student. Um, Amira, you have a question? Yeah, um, I'm a Chinese language learner, and I was just wondering if there are opportunities to like improve Chinese or like use my Chinese as part of either the trip or the class. Yeah, I mean, I th I think that it's um, um, I think it's great that if someone who has a background in Chinese language to apply because. Um, the lab leaders may ask uh, students if they have that abilities to look at um, documents and do research in, in, in Chinese. Now, um, that being said, of course, it's not a requirement for you to know Chinese in order to apply. Um, so don't it, you don't have that background. That's OK. No, there's no problem with it. Um, I think it, if someone is selected, that has a, who has a background in the Chinese language. I think it, 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 it does be helpful. And of course, when you go to, let's say perhaps you go to parts of mainland China, then you'll be, of course, be um, really useful to the group because you can speak the language um, as well. Um, when we, um, traditionally in the past, we have, um, sometimes we could hire translators or we can use translators or we relied on our, academic partners for translators uh, to translate stuff. So, um, so, um, so yeah, like I just want to mention, don't, don't think that you have to know Chinese to apply to this, this program. Yeah. Thank you. Any more questions or? Rebecca, uh, Mira, I just want to add, add Mira, that we have had students also do internships after the clinic trip is over that would get more in depth into the topic, for example. And so I could, pers I could imagine, depending on your college's capacity to support internships, um, that you could either stay in country or do research to follow up that might be more focused on the language part of it that maybe your lab group didn't have the capacity to do or didn't have the time to do. So there are this is the beauty of this um, program is there's lots of opportunities. It's it's amount of how much you want to invest in it and what kinds of resources we can muster for you. Uh, is there any more questions or um, for us? If, could I jump in with the follow-up question to that comment? I, I was curious about that 
um, idea of doing research in the country after the conclusion of the trip. And I was wondering if there is a precedent of students doing that before, and if so, what that's looked like, because um, I know that that caught my interest in particular. Yeah, we've had uh, one student, I think, do work in Singapore, right? Is that right, Albert? Uh, Singapore and then um, also Thailand. Thailand, right. Yeah, so they've, they've, um, they've been able to um, do um, internships and we had some funding for that internship stuff. And sometimes it was associated with the lab, sometimes it was totally independent and a totally different topic that they really wanted to pursue during the summer. So I don't think we saved a lot of money for internships this year, but I'm pretty sure CMC and Pomona have some dedicated funds for students from those colleges that could uh, do an internship in the summer. I think, Valerie, you still have two internships this summer, right? Or one? Yeah, I think that um, if you're a CMC student uh, and you become a fellow and you want to um, do an internship in the area at the place that where we're going, then uh, we can work with um, the Sol Center in arranging funding. Um, and I, I think the same thing with Pomona too. Yeah. And, 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 and that's not because we deliberately just focus on CMC and Pomona. It's just that's where the, the two schools had offered a, a, the, that line of funding um, um, for EnviroLab Asia. But we've had script students work in uh, yeah. Burma and uh, Thailand. So, you know, there, yeah. there have been some, it, once, you, you know, it's, once you get here, we're going to find stuff for you as much as we can. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Looks like Chloe has her hand up. Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, so I have a question relating to, there seems at the end of each lab to be this kind of final product that you do, I'm assuming, with your cohort. Does that take place before the clinic trip at the end of the class, or is it something that you're working on during the clinic trip and after? That's taken many different forms through the year, so there's no one answer. Okay. One thing, we do like to have a product at the end of the clinic trip. Um, and so what has worked successfully is that kind of over the semester, before you go, you kind of build what your idea of what you're going to do, write a, maybe write a proposal and do kind of a preliminary presentation of your proposal. And then when you're there, you can kind of do some research. Um, and we had an alumni dinner where students presented their kind of the results of their research with 24 hours of time to synthesize what they had found. So very kind of um, off the cuff to the alumni panel. Um, and then what we've had is sometimes students have come back and then some students have stayed involved with the research. So one student um, used samples we collected and ended up doing her senior thesis on those samples. Um, Albert, uh, Professor Park and um, Los Huertos, they have an ongoing project with um, carbon accounting for um, a site we visited about two years ago. So that is kind of, there's kind of two layers. There's the one immediate one that everyone's involved with. But once you're done the clinic trip, we do consider your commitment to be done in kind of um, as we've kind of built the program. But we hope that you will continue to be involved past that. We've had students um, give um, talks before, um, participate in panels. And so we do hope that there'll be kind of other types of products that will come out of it as well. It's kind of sharing your experiences. You've, um, if you go, you're one of kind of the ones you get to go and sort of come back and kind of share what you've learned um, with others is a hopeful expectation for post-clinic trip. Um, and if we are able to leverage this into an internship or something, then we can kind of dream a bit bigger about what the product is. Awesome, thank you. Um, and I do have one follow-up question. You just kind of painted a more clear picture for me. So in terms of the people that come along on the clinic trip and that you also engage with during it, it sounds like each lab is four students, if that's correct, 16 total. Um, and then the professors from the labs come, I'm assuming, and then you. And then who do we kind of interact with during the trip um, within like those lab groups? Yeah, so that varies a lot. Again, depending on the lab, we have worked with nonprofits before, um, with academic institutions, um, who else have we worked with, um, with contacts that we've made through some of our faculty lab leaders. So it really depends, but we always try and have a local partner, um, so that we're not just going in and doing our work and leaving. So we like to contribute to a project that's going on there. Ideally, the project gives back to them, 
um, in some way, but it depends again on what the project is and how it works. But there will always be someone on the grounds there that we're, we're working with. We've been able to do that model every time, but who that is has been different depending on the project and the goal. Great, thank you so much. Um, and just for the lab sizes, we aim for 16 students, but there was one year, I think a few more students squeaked in. So. And budget, depends on budget. Depends on budget. Uh, if there's no more questions, Rebecca, is there anything that they should know before we um, sign off? Um, yeah, I can just list some very quick um, deadlines so you guys know what the time frame is, because I'm sure some of you will apply and then you'll be waiting for emails like for a really long time checking every day. So applications are currently open now and you can access them. I believe I put the link up. It's a uh, tiny URL on the application material. Let me just make sure. Okay, so it's tinyurl.com backslash China Fellow. Again, information is in the chat box. We'll be on social media. You can't miss it unless you're not checking any of these things. The applications will close on the 20th of October at 10 p.m. So please make sure that it's in by that time. We won't be accepting them afterwards. And then just to give you a general time frame. The last week of October and the first week of November, we will be doing interviews. So that will be if you are selected during the initial phase, you will go on to the interview stage. Um, for all of you, all of you will hear back with a decision whether you're accepted, waitlisted, or not accepted by November 15th at the very latest. But you can expect to hear back a little bit earlier than that if you have been accepted. So November 15th will be the last day to wait. Mm -hmm. Um, there's one more question. Ray, uh, is it Rhea? Not seeing this. Oh. Oh, uh, yeah. I, you know, we can't hear you. Here, let me. Oh, yeah, you're muted. All right. No, no. Rhea, do you want to send it to us in the chat if your sound is not work, working? She's yeah, she's typing it. Okay. So the, um, I'm sorry, get, sorry, let me get the question. Um, so the hope is, and pretty much we are expecting to complete the, co I mean, not the COVID trip, <laughs> clinic trip, uh, sorry, uh, clinic trip uh, for sure. Now we have uh, backup plans in case that we can't travel to, um, uh, China itself or the region of East Asia. Uh, th that, and those backup plans may include going to domestic locations here in the United States. Um, and the one area that's been uh, commonly discussed is Hawaii. Um, but uh, that's something that we are monitoring, of course, um, about, about going to uh, East Asia. Fortunately, uh, countries in Asia are loosening up requirements, no longer requiring quarantines if you are vaccinated. And th that's another thing. Everyone on the tr trip has to be fully vaccinated. Um, and um, we will make a final decision on whether we're going to hold the clinic trip in China or other parts of East Asia, um, roughly around February, early, early March. Um, but one way or the other, we would like to complete the clinic trip this year. Okay, I think that's it. Um, feel oh, free to, oh, sorry. Sorry, there's one more question. Um, what types of questions would be asked during the interview? <laughs> I would say we're not gonna give that away. <laughs> <laughs> 
Maybe as I look at the, the interview yeah. questions here. <laughs> one of the things to consider too is we want it to be a fair process. So we wouldn't give something that like yeah. we wouldn't talk about that with a group like this. I know the recording's available, but some people attended an info session last week. And the big thing is we want everybody to have the same experience when they interview. Um, so we would um if if that was something that we wanted you to prepare for, then we would have made sure that was freely available to everybody in the application materials. Um, but the questions are not designed to um, stump you. They're just designed to get to know you a little bit um, and for you to get to know us a little bit and what the labs are. So they're um, meant to, to kind of, um, yeah, just be, be gentle questions to have more of a discussion. Um, and you don't need to think about it as like an evaluation. And just to let you know, yeah, exactly what, um, yeah, that's exactly right, Brandon. That's spot on. Um, just to let you know, um, the lab leaders um, will be in the, um, not every single lab leader will be at the interview, but um, the, if you, for example, have um, selected two labs that you wanted to be part of and that two lab leaders had selected you, they'll, um, you'll have two separate um, probably interviews um, with each lab leader. Um, and Rebecca, uh, Rebecca will also be in with at the interview, helping to ask questions. Um, Brandon and myself, uh, Mark, may enter the conversations here and there, maybe the interviews, but by and large, we won't be present at the interviews. But we are lucky to have two lab leaders here with us today. Oh, yeah. Three. Oh, yeah, 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 definitely. <laughs> Sorry about that. No. Um, okay, is there any more questions? If not, then uh, feel free to email Rebecca or any of us if you have questions about any, anything. And we look forward to um, getting your applications and getting to know you all. Thank you for attending everyone. We hope this has been helpful. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you all. Thank Bye. you. Thank you so much. Bye.